My spa contract has 20 ETH and it has a massive bug that anyone can exploit. I just got this message from a hacker basically saying that they're giving me a day to find a way to withdraw the funds from the contract myself or else they will attack it. Imagine if this was a situation you were in. For learning purposes, we are going to create this contract that has this bug, we are going to exploit it, and then write a smart contract that has better codes so that it is not vulnerable to this type of attack. So this is a code right here and I'll quickly explain it. So we call the contract victim and it's using safe map for UN256, which means we won't have to worry about overflow and underflow problems. That's beautiful. And now we have a mapping that's called balances. And in that mapping, we store the addresses and the user's balance, which is UN256. So there are two functions, deposit and withdraw. The deposit is a payable public function and it allows users to deposit ETH. And then once they send ETH, the balances mapping is updated. So therefore we know for each sender, we know how much value they have deposited within the smart contract. And then we have a withdraw function, which is public because we need all users to withdraw from the smart contract. And basically we check to see whether or not that user has deposited before, which means their balances will be greater than zero. Once it is, we then send the money to their wallet. And once that transaction has succeeded, we also update the balances of that particular user is zero. So the way for someone to drain the funds from the smart contract is to find a way to keep calling the withdrawal function without us realizing so that they can just keep draining all the funds from the smart contract even though they have not deposited that much. They definitely do need to deposit something because of this line, but is there a way for them to keep calling this line without this line happening? The answer is actually yes. Before we go into the attack, let's see if the victim contract works normally. First thing I want to do is deploy the smart contract. Beautiful, this is deployed. And I'm going to allow two users to send 10 ETH. So, I'm using Remix so that you can easily demonstrate this yourself and deposit 10. And then I'm allowing another user to also deposit 10 ETH. Okay, so the smart contract now has 20 ETH. The only person who can call withdraw on this smart contract is someone who actually has the funds. So if I take another user and I call withdraw, they would say, how can you? Like the transaction will fail. It's because the user did not deposit that amount in the smart contract. That seems correct. So let us move on to the attacker smart contract and see how that works. The attacker smart contract is going to do something called a re-entrancy attack. I'm going to deploy the contract attacker and I have to give it the address of the victim contract. So I'm just going to put that in there and then I am going to attack it. So first I have to send one ether to the method call attack and then boom. Now we see the balance of the attacker contract is 20 ETH. This person was able to attack the victim contract, withdraw all of the ETH, and it didn't even deposit that much ETH. All it did was deposit one ETH and pay for gas fees. So how does this work? So first you deposit one ETH, and then you say withdraw. When you say withdraw, we then get into this method into the victim contract. It will check to see whether it has a balance. The answer will be yes. It will then send Ether to your smart contract. So it will send it to the message.sender. In this case, the message.sender is a smart contract. So when it sends it to the message.sender, this function will then be called. Normally, the kind of users within the smart contract were expected to be just regular addresses. The person who created the smart contract didn't expect it to be a smart contract. And since it is a smart contract, the clever thing that's happening is that they have now created a receive function within its smart contract. And in the receive function, it basically calls withdraw again. This is a property of smart contracts. They are called callback functions, which can be called in particular scenarios. If you were to send value to a smart contract, so you send some money to a smart contract, there are two functions that can be called receive or fallback. The receive function is called if you do not specify a method within the smart contract. When it has a receive function, which is payable, it has now received the ETH and is called withdraw again. So it first checks to see if the victim contract does have a balance more than one Ether because that's how much it sent. And once it does, it will call withdraw again. So again, it calls withdraw because the balance has not been updated yet, it does withdraw it. This is horrible. So let's walk through the code a little bit more deeper so we can understand how it works. So in the attacker contract, it expects the address of the victim contract because it knows the contract is going to exploit. It creates a function called receive. Anytime you send ETH to the attacker smart contract and no method was specified, then it's going to automatically call this function. It checks to see if the balance of the victim contract is more than one ether. That's because if the victim contract has less ETH, then the entire withdrawal will fail because it had no ETH to send. So it makes sure that it's, it does it successfully. It keeps calling withdraw. So it does this until it drains the victim contract and it walks away with money. So I'm going to show you one of the ways you can fix this smart contract. We are going to use this contract called Survivor. 
and it is very similar to the victim contract. But the difference that we made is that we changed the order in which we did particular operations. Instead of updating the balances after we send the ETH, we updated before. So from this contract's perspective, everything will still work out the same way, meaning that the person will deposit ETH, they'll be able to withdraw and everything will work. But we are changing this line up. And the reason why this is important is because if we put this line, which is the effect of this operations, the effect of the withdrawal is that the balances within the smart contract is now set to zero. Then we send the value. That means when we send this value to the attacker smart contract, if the attacker now calls withdraw again, because this was already set to zero, when it checks the balance of the attacker, it will then be zero. So let's try this. So let's deploy the survivor smart contract. And then we're going to send ETH to the smart contract again. So we're going to let the user risk their money again and send ETH. And then another user is going to send 10 ETH. All right, wonderful. And then if we go back to the survivor contract, we are then going to copy the address of the survivor contract and then redeploy the attacker smart contract. So the attacker smart contract is going to take the address of the survivor and that smart contract has been deployed. And now if we try to attack the survivor smart contract by hitting an attack, it would say reverted with reason, failed to send ether. That's because when it first sent the one ETH, the, which is the balance of the attacker address, it would then set the balance to zero and then send it. When it tries to do it a second time wrong, it will fail. By doing this, I was able to save 20 ETH by exploiting my own contract, extracting the funds. I'll rebate my users and say, sorry about this. I'm so sorry what happened. I have a safer smart contract. Then I'm able to redeploy the smart contract with better code. Or if you were to have an upgradable smart contract, then you would be able to do that as well. So there are other ways you can go about solving this problem. And actually, this solution is a solidity design pattern, which is called the checks effects interactions pattern. First, you check to see whether or not this user has the ability to do something. Then you update the effects of this. The effect within the smart contract is the fact that the balances are updated. And then the interaction is the fact that I'm now going to send this ETH to the person who called the smart contract. But there are other ways to solve this. And actually, OpenZaplin has something called the reentrancy guard, and it's the contract module that prevents reentrant calls to a function. So by inheriting from the reentrancy guard, and you use the non reentrant modifier, this will prevent other smart contracts from trying some sort of reentrancy exploit within your code. So maybe we can try this. So if I create a new smart contract, and I call it reentrancy survival 2.sol. Copy the original victim code. And then I'm going to call it survivor2. And then I'm going to import this from OpenZeppelin. And in the same function, I'm going to say non reentrance. Non reentrance. So you say the contract is of type reentrance you got it inherits from that and then you're going to use a modifier non reentrant so i am now going to deploy the smart contract survivor 2 so it's deployed so now i will just quickly fund it with two eth just for a quick demonstration and click deposit and then the next thing i'm going to do is deploy the attacker smart contract again and this time i'll feed it with the address of the new survivor smart contract so then click deploy and now I'm going to attack this survivor contract, which we have used the open Zeppelin reentrancy guard with. And you can see the transaction fails. So it uses the old code, which we know for sure is buggy, but because I use the open Zeppelin reentrancy guard, I can see it fails. So that is perfect. This scenario that I created wasn't a real scenario. I didn't have a smart contract that was actually deployed to mainnet with users funds. However, I highly recommend you use the reentrancy guard from open Zeppelin. There's a book called Mastering Ethereum, which I highly recommend for learning about building smart contracts in Solidity. And for a quick crash course about building Solidity so that you can see whether or not this is a programming language for you, check out this video here, Solidity Crash Course in 20 minutes.